Hello, everybody, and welcome to the third seminar dedicated to Mohale Mashiho, our author in residence from October 2020 to January 2021. Uh, this year is our third edition of Ariel, which means author in residence. It's an international residence in Lorraine here in France. It's a project that was initiated by Barbara Schmidt, Céline Sabiron and Amy Pelletier. We're able to welcome our author in residence th thanks to our generous sponsors, the University of Lorraine, IUT Charlemagne, UFR ALL Nancy, IDEA and Métropole du Grand Nancy. I'd also like to thank our colleagues, Uh, who have helped with the organization, Céline, Monica, Claire, Nathalie, Estelle, Luc Debert for the technical aspects of these YouTube seminars, as well as our research assistants who've been working hard to advertise these events, Lisa, Pauline, Delphine, Erast, and Elise, who are all master's degree students. Tonight, we're welcoming two speakers, Lorena Rizzo from Basel University and Cédric Courtois from Lille University. Both are specialists of African studies and will open up this seminar series to contexts other than South Africa, in particular Namibia and Nigeria. So I hope that there are many of you here tonight for following this seminar. If you have any questions or any comments, do not hesitate to write them down next to the YouTube video and our guests will be answering them after their presentation. Uh, so I'm going to ask Pauline uh, now to introduce our first guest. So Lorena Rizzo is a senior lecturer and the co-chair of the Center for African Studies at the University of Basel. She's a historian of Namibia and South Africa with a special interest in gender and visual history. She was a visiting fellow at the Department for and in 2010, Photography and History in Colonial Southern Africa, Shades of Empire at Woodledge and Wits University Press, and the Journal of African History, Social History. Forming narratives, women and photography in the Uzakos old location. And Celine, please, I think we can show the first photograph. Okay, just a brief explanation uh, what this image is about. What you can see here is an open field, basically uh, what is called today the Uzakos old location. The photograph was taken by the late Paul Grendon in 2013. And towards the right of the image in the very back, you see a mountain range illuminated by the sun. And in very, I mean, it's very small. You can see a few houses uh, in front of the mountain range, even a, a church, and that's a township um, today in Uzakos. Uh, the rest of the town would be if you would leave the, the photographic frame uh, towards uh, your left. Okay, so in 2012, my colleague Giorgio Miesha and I visited Uzakos, a small town in central Namibia, halfway between the capital of Windhoek and Swakopmund on the Atlantic coast. Our main interest was in doing a series of interviews with local residents about the town's history, notably its importance as a former railway center and the implementation of spatial segregation and apartheid urban planning in the period between the 1920s and the 1960s. This is the context in which we were introduced to four female senior members of the community all of whom were said to have rich knowledge of Uzakos's past. What we did not know at that point was that the four women with whom we would begin long-term conversations were passionate collectors. Cecilia Geises, Olga Garoes, Gisela Peters and Wilhelmine Kachimune assembled and preserved a remarkable and diverse corpus of photographs some of which date as far back as the early 1900s. While the collections they kept cover a wide range of locations, time periods and subjects, one of the centerpieces of their archives consists of those photographs that relate to the so-called old location of Uzakos and roughly cover the period between the late 1920s and the early 1960s. 
the Usakos old location was the result of residential and racial segregation that began in the late 1920s. Its establishment served to merge hitherto separate African settlements into one consolidated residential area and segregate it from those sections of town set apart for white residents. With the beginning of formal apartheid in 1948, urban development of all Namibian towns was placed under direct South African administration and was given yet another edge. Uzakos was no excep exception, and by the mid-1950s, plans emerged to move the African location once again, since it was still considered to be situated too closely to the white parts of town. As a result, more than 1,500 black residents were forcibly removed to a new township between 1961 and 1968. The cleared area is today an open field marked by ruins of former private houses and public buildings. Next image, please. Our encounter with Cecilia, Wilhelmine, Olga and Gisela was the beginning of a collaborative project which continues up to this day and has since been enriched by the involvement of colleagues, students, artists and community activists. It led to the establishment of a local museum in Usakos in 2015 and a series of mobile exhibitions in Southern Africa, Europe and the United States. Our current uh, focus is to secure the local museum and support a group of young Namibian activists, artists and community members in their desire to turn the museum into a space for public engagement and creative practice. In a poor and marginalized Namibian town in which the corona pandemic has now exacerbated ongoing economic harshness and social political crisis, Holding on to the idea of a communal creative space is an immense challenge. In my talk today, I would like to go back to the beginnings of our project and highlight Cecilia's, Wilhelmine's, Olga's and Gisela's agency in the domain of photography and point out some of the ways in which their photographic practice was part of a range of cultural and representational forms through which they negotiated their pasts and made sense of their presence. It is the intricacy and sophistication of their work of preservation, remembrance and historical imagination that remains at the heart of the local museum in Usakos. Given the context of this seminar, I likewise wish to indicate some of the ways in which the women's aesthetic and photographic practice is related to oral forms of historical narration. Next image, please. The old location photographs the four women shared with us comprise approximately 250 black and white images, most of which are portraits of individuals and groups taken outside in front of a house in a square or under a big tree. Occasionally, there are studio photographs as well. The pictures show family members, friends and acquaintances, neighbors and visitors, teachers and missionaries, some of whom were residents of the old location, other parts of Usakos or neighboring villages, and yet others who had come from far and wide. The dynamics of collecting, image use and storage provide these photographic collections with an idiosyncratic, discursive and performative energy and the material diversity, the variability of styles, genres and image content point to the distinctiveness of the photographs shifting contexts of production and use. While there are a few snapshots in the collections taken at parties, cultural festivals or sports events, most of the photographs were clearly staged, that is enacted carefully by the photographic subjects themselves and the photographers, many of whom were black. 
The recurrence of particular natural and architectural features, among them big trees or public buildings in the old location, as well as requisites such as chairs and tables, confirm the impression of attentively negotiated photographic occasions. Our approach to these collections drew inspiration from photographer Santu Mofokeng's Black Photo Album, a visual reflection on officially uncared for private photographic collections in early 20th century South Africa. It resonated with his book in as much as we have called the Usakos Photographic Collections albums. The term is suggestive, particularly so if we think of the collections kept by Cecilia, Olga, Gisela and Wilhelmine from the vantage point of the idea of personal or private albums. Within this framework, albums are seen to be embedded in memory practices they function as pictorial aide memoir and once shared with family, friends and other viewers and interlocutors help recall and narrate the past in particular ways, whereby the album constitutes the material manifestation and symbolic expression of our sustained connection to that past. The old occasion albums are and have been part of memory work and they emerge from a preoccupation with transgenerational continuity in remembering a particular time and place, the old location, and the experience of disruption, dislocation, and forced removal. As objects and collections of images, they evidence specific female practices of composition, narration, and performance, which place the albums at the interface of the personal intimate and reflective, and the public, conversational and communicative. Because the albums include portraits of individuals, most of whom have passed away, and sites that no longer exist, the Usakos Old Location albums have become, to the women who kept them, cherished, precious and important tokens of affection. Indeed, the photographic collections are embedded in hybrid assemblages of texts, images and small objects, letters, photographs, notes and slips of paper, personal documents, sketches and drawings, personal objects and knickknacks, all of which outline the contours of an intimate landscape of personal articulation, remembrance and memorialization. But there are likewise more structural characteristics evoked by the notion of the album. Photographic albums have been popular genres since the 19th century and personal and family albums especially have often been understood as a medium and idiom for the social construction, symbolic reproduction and normative staging of the family, the bourgeois family in particular. This is why it is important to keep in mind the album's element of discursive fabrication and concurrently its hybridity in terms of narrative and function. Albums do and are multiple things. They are sagas, chronicles, life stories, autobiographies, legends, photo romances, all at once. The narratives they unfold are always crafted and created and they do not necessarily follow a linear and uniform pattern. In the case of the Usakos photographs, this discursive hybridity and formal openness is very strong at the level of the material or the materiality, because the collections do not constitute albums in a narrow sense. Though Cecilia and Wilhelmine kept some of their old location photographs in actual albums, in terms of their narrative composition and performativity, the symbolic importance of the old location albums for the reproduction of social worlds, the family, the neighborhood, the community, is striking against the backdrop of imperiled livelihoods shattered by colonialism and apartheid, and more recently by socio-economic decline and intergenerational conflict. If we understand the photographic collections kept by the four women 
as an aesthetic and cultural form working against the disruption of their physical and social environments and as a creative way of sustaining the continuity of personal and collective memories. We have to pay attention to the ways in which these women composed and crafted the visual narratives of the past, thereby keeping an eye on their inclusions and preferences as much as their omissions and silences. The album's narrative oscillation between the private and the public, its visual and discursive play with inclusion and exclusion, enunciation and silence, was rearranged once the viewing conditions shifted and the Usakos photographic collections moved from the private space of the women's personal archives to the public space of an exhibition and local museum. In other words, the shifts from one narrative space to another, from one condition of consumption to another, from a more intimate context of viewing to a more collective or public one, invited us to reconsider the photographs' place and function in the narration and memorialization of the past. This process is an ongoing one, and it is today supported by the Museums Association of Namibia and shaped by residents, artists and activists in Usakos, all of whom continue to explore what kind of space they want their museum to become. Um, next image, please. But let me return to the women's personal archives and the practices that clustered around them, especially if we wish to attend to some of the ways in which the visual is entangled with the oral in more explicit ways. In what I've said before, it should have been clear that collecting and curating photographs, assembling them in albums, exchanging them with family, friends and neighbours, and using them in conversations about the past and the present, are deeply embedded in oral forms of remembrance and memory work. In relation to Cecilia's, Wilhelmine's, Olga's and Gisela's photographic collections more specifically, this crucially involved the practice of naming, naming people and places. It also included storytelling and praising those who are no more. Given that the old location photographs pertain to a space and time that was violently disrupted by apartheid, racial segregation and forced removal, orality and memory act as forms of animation. Animation helps insert the physical trace of a person contained in the photograph into multi-layered representations of an individual, that is, the being that can never be contained in the image. In other words, photographs are animated and animating objects, and they often constitute powerful surrogates for the deceased since, unlike any other aesthetic form, perhaps, they stage moments of desired contact between those who live and those who are no more in an actual, seemingly unmediated way. Southern African understandings of photographs often make a close association between image and self, and many African languages use the same word for photographic negative as for ghost or dead spirit. I am not suggesting here that animist responses to photography should be understood in terms of an African alterity, a myth inherited from colonial anthropological literature, and therefore distinguished from the rationality of Western modern understandings of the photographic medium. As is well known, post-mortem photography became common practice in the second half of the 19th century in the metropoles and across empire. In the Namibian, and I'd say also in the South African context, we also need to keep in mind communalistic elements of settler culture that make the inheritance of animation and animism a much more complex one than most accounts would have it. But what matters more 
is that the aesthetic and photographic preoccupation with the presence of those who passed away, with the dead, in other words, helps us explain recurrent phenomena such as memory, remembrance and trauma, especially in societies saturated with experiences of violence and death. Here, the concern is with the presence of the past, and notably a past that actually existed. What Cecilia's, Wilhelmine's, Olga's and Gisela's photographic practice argues for, I believe, is an intimate relationship with the past predicated on an unmediated access to actual things that we can see, hear, feel and touch and bring one into contact with that past. The importance of the photographic collections lies precisely in the possibilities they offer these four Namibian women as a form and idiom of historical consciousness. How, in other words, the albums became part of grappling with the disappearance and return of their diseased beloved ones. Photography's metonymical quality is critical here because the absence of an individual, a mother, a friend, a lover, is marked by the presence of the photographic images enriched by the stories told about them. As images and objects thus animated, the Usakos albums constituted a particular narrative modality, one that is additive rather than sequential and layers time and space into idiosyncratic clusters of meaning by which Gisela, Olga, Wilhelmine and Cecilia would link the presence of the past to their present concern with displacement, community building and belonging. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lorena, for your uh, paper. I think it's uh, very interesting to have um, more about the context on Namibia. I think while we wait for questions to arrive, uh, I was wondering if you could clarify so far in this seminar series, we've been talking a lot about South Africa, um, not so much about Namibia. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about um, whether the meaning of township um, differs in Namibia and South Africa, and maybe if you can tell us more about different photographic uh, practices in um, Namibia and South Africa, or if there are similarities between the two. Yes, uh, so thank you. Um, so one thing then, no, uh, generally speaking, there are no differences between townships in Namibia and South Africa. Uh, the important distinction, which is relevant in my paper, is the distinction between an African location and a township. So townships are the result of apartheid urban planning in the 50s and onwards. Uh, in the interwar period, African residential areas in cities across Namibia and South Africa are called locations. Um, so the terminology is specific historically and not ge geographically. Uh, the important thing about to know about Namibia is uh, Namibia becomes, most people know Namibia as a former German colony, um, but it becomes a South African colony after the first uh, World War and stays so until 1990. Um, so the longest uh, period in the 20th century in Namibia is marked by South African colonialism. And what you have is that South Africa, the South, South African South Africa to the Namibian context. So as you have it in South Africa, every town uh, is organized according um, to uh, racial segregation and urban planning. Um, in terms of the photographic practices, as far as we know now, uh, there are certain differences between um, the history of the medium in South Africa as compared to uh, Namibia. Um, one reason is you have less urbanization, less mobility, probably a smaller scale of circulation of cameras, uh, camera equipment, etc. Um, 
for the Namibian context, I would say that up to the period after the Second World War, we do not know of any black uh, Namibian photographer, uh, neither men nor women. Uh, most of them are white. Um, and that was the reason why in this particular project, at some point we decided it's simply frustrating. If you follow photographers, you're going to end up with white men for a very long time, even in the South African context. And if you want to highlight in the domain of photography, you need to move away from the kind of focus on authorship, if you like, and engage or look at what it is people do in the domain of photography and work with a very broad notion of photographic practices. And that's how we came across the, this collection eventually. But this is really preliminary knowledge because we simply don't know. And we haven't done enough work in terms of moving beyond official archives, the big collections, and actually asking people if they keep photographs, if they had cameras, if they know of members of families or communities who uh, worked as photographers earlier uh, than the 50s or 60s. All right, thank you very much. Um, we have a question from Cédric Courtois, uh, who's asking if you can elaborate a bit more on the visual being entangled with the oral aspect. Yeah, thank you. Um, so um, I guess I'm making this argument because I frankly have to say for a very long time in my work, I worked with collections uh, where I didn't know who took the images, who was in the images. Um, so if you, I mean, if you look at exhibitions that use historical uh, photography from Southern Africa, less sure for West Africa would be different. Um, you often don't know who the people are, right? So there's a strange kind of sense of emptiness and of um, a flatness of the individual represented in the image besides the kind of concern with um, stereotypical representation of Africans in historical photographs. Um, so the sense of how can the, the person in, in the image be brought to life and what is it that makes historical photographs so attractive um, to communities who are concerned with um, rebuilding themselves through a kind of engagement with their history. I think the kind of oral um, practice around these photographs is absolutely crucial. And one um, part of that, a very kind of obvious one in some ways, and in a colonial context, it's not obvious at all, is that you actually name people and you insist on them being named um, rather than treating them as anonymous representatives. So I think there's, there's a first. So for me, this concept of animation, somehow to using a word which is, I'm fully aware of how it's charged um, historically and in a kind of colonial anthropological framework, but I'm interested in the kind of complexity um, in what it means for us to animate objects and Im images and how we manage to bring people alive. Um, I'm not sure uh, if you need the image for, for to do that. If you look at, you know, oral literatures and genres in Southern Africa, praise poetry doesn't need an image to somehow recreate the person in the present and make they, them come alive. So the entanglement between the visual and, and, the, and the oral, if you ask about the being that is being recreated in front of your eye, inner and outer eye, um, I'm not sure. I would have to think more about it. Uh, thank you. We have another question from one of our master's students, uh, Ludovic Diaz who says, um, I missed a little piece of the presentation due to my poor connection. What is the place 
of photographs in personal or family narrative in um, these traditionally oral cultures? Um, well, I think it's an important one. I mean, it's clearly a new medium. You know, people for a very long time, people would say it's a new, they're fully aware that it's being introduced at a later stage. Uh, in Southern Africa, cameras travel along the railway lines, as in many other places as well. So they actually reach rural areas much earlier than we might assume for the Southern African contexts. Uh, the interwar period in Namibia is really fascinating in terms of what seems to be possible. It's still rather open if you compare it to uh, the period after the Second World War, once uh, apartheid um, takes root. So there's a circulation of, you know, American cars, modern cameras, uh, fancy dress. There's a kind of music. Uh, books, uh, whatever. Uh, so it's quite rich in terms of how people can access um, uh, photographic equipment. Uh, I think it becomes really important in a kind of within the framework of representing African modernities. Uh, cosmopolitanism, be it being your part, become part of a kind of a Christian community, mo modern Christian community, as part of a kind of culture of where the arts and music begin to mark urban urban milieus in Southern Africa. Uh, I think it's it is important. I don't think people see it as antagonistic in terms of that it would replace oral forms. Uh, I think oral literature. Um, it's, I mean, they merge uh, whatever they have at hand. And I think the attractiveness of photography is probably also a question of generational taste. Uh, young people might be attractive more to new objects uh, than uh, older people, but I wouldn't generalize that at all. Um, I think they use it, it's used together. It's seen as part of a broader repertoire of aesthetic and cultural forms. Um, I would not be able to answer what the kind of presence of photographic images does in terms of shifts at the level of all the literature. Uh, that would be actually interesting. But do, do you know how the um, personal albums were used? That is, do you know if the... Yes, they I used do. Them basically in their own uh, private lives? Um, yes and no. So what they did, I mean, uh, because of, for time reasons, I didn't, I mean, it's absolutely fascinating if you see the collections, how they were organized, at least in the beginning when we met these women. So most of the photographs were kept in plastic bags in little tins, uh, in envelopes. So they were kind of disorganized. Um, I, I don't want to use this as a negative term, not at all. I mean, it's very poor communities. It's hard for people, um, you know, to build a home in the first place. Um, and they were mixed up with all sorts of objects and images and documents and papers. So there wasn't a strict sense, a division of, uh, in terms of categories, right? You, div you divide the visual material from the, not an archive in that sense. Um, some of them did have conventional albums uh, where they did place the photographs, but what most of them did is that they had little exhibitions in their living rooms or um, in the public rooms of their houses where they would exhibit objects. And so besides being collectors, these women are curators also. They make exhibitions. Uh, some of them are kept in vitrines. Others are just photographs on the walls. Um, so I was interested in those kinds of practices, which is, of course, more communicative. I mean, it's visible to everyone who comes to your house, right? It's a less intimate kind of 
um, situation where you would look at images with family members only, for example. They exchanged uh, images quite a lot, so they sent them around. I mean, this is a place where you had a migrant labor system, um, so people were separated. Uh, including couples and families. Uh, so the circulation of photographs is absolutely critical. Uh, they're sent with letters and um, so it's private in a certain way, uh, but it's also very public in some other ways. I think we might have the time for a final question and I'm going to take it because it's going to do a nice connection with Cédric's paper. Um, you, you mentioned the representation of trauma or the connection of the photographs with trauma and I was wondering if you could tell us more because that's what Cédric, Cédric is going to tell us about trauma so maybe we can yeah, on that yeah. topic. <laughs> I mean, you know, and this is a um, the photograph I showed, the first photograph I showed, and the second one actually, where you see the old showers in the old location. So what we did, if you walk through that field, um, people who lived in that neighborhood would be able to show you the foundations of their former houses and where they lived and who their neighbors were and. Um, yeah, the uh, one back, or maybe even two back. Well, yeah, I mean, so this is about, um, I mean, forced removals uh, in Namibia. I mean, it's never the scale of forced removals in the big cities in South Africa. I mean, we tend to associate apartheid urban planning and forced removals with Cape Town and Johannesburg. Uh, 1,500 people is a lot for Namibia and it's the period in which uh, forced removals take place. Some of them are very violent in the capital of Namibia and Windhoek. Uh, it ends up with shootings of people. In Usakos, they're not massive. There's not an escalation of violence, but it's a massive traumatic experience for that generation who were forced to leave. Um, most of the owners of the houses in the old location were women. So they lost uh, um, their property, their homes, their families. I mean, it's a complete breakdown of the African um, part of Uzakos, um, uh, society. And in that sense, it's considered to be a very traumatic um, experience. I think more generally speaking, because I mean, there was a war later on, a war of, of liberation, depending on whom you speak to. And there's something about South African or Southern African landscapes uh, that have been so massively brutalized um, during colonialism and apartheid. There's a sense of a permanent kind of haunting uh, by these histories and by, by the dead. Um, basically. So I think there's something about the photographic medium that helps people come to terms with um, massive scales of dying uh, and the fact that, I mean, many, many people have not been traced. Um, so there's, uh, it's unfinished business in the sense that you wouldn't know where the remains or, or the bodies, actual bodies of many people are. It's not that heavy here in the Usakos context. It's not a topic here, but it's in many others. And I think that's what makes this medium so attractive in communities that actually grapple uh, with this kind of haunting. Wonderful, thank you. I just I was trying to unmute my phone, <laughs> my um, <laughs> my microphone. Well, thank you very much, uh, Lorena, for all of this. Uh, many thanks for your presentation. Um, uh, maybe we'll have the time for some common questions with Cédric at the end of his presentation. Um, so many thanks. We'll um, um, 
move on to Cedric's presentation. I think there will be some nice connections around trauma, uh, but also around different forms. Uh, we were talking about photographs, and this time we're moving to uh, novels and um, the graphic novel as well. So we'll have lots of different things to say, I think, about form. Uh, so Budin is going to introduce our next speaker. So Cédric Courtois is an assistant professor at the University of Lille, specializing in Nigerian literature, which was the focus of his PhD dissertation entitled Itineraries of a Genre, Variations on the Bildungsroman in Contemporary Nigerian Fiction. He has published various articles and book chapters on the rewritings of the Bildungsroman genre in contemporary Nigerian fiction, mobility studies, refugee literature, and LGBTQ studies. His research interests include postcolonial literature, decoloniality, transnationalism, transculturalism, gender studies, eco-poetics, eco-feminism, gender studies, and the ethics and aesthetics of violence in African literature written in English. The title of his contribution today is Remember that others have walked this path before you, writing about trauma in Yejide Kilanko's Daughters Who Walked This Path, Moali Mashiro's The Yearning, and Yuna's Becoming and Becoming. Thank you. I'm waiting for uh, the PowerPoint uh, document. And I have uh, quite a bad connection, so I hope it's going to be fine. I have prepared a wonderful PowerPoint document for you. I'm very proud of it. <laughs> I'm just waiting for it to appear. Um, Okay, maybe I can actually start. Um, so in, in Mohale Mashiro's 2016 debut novel, The Yearning, the protagonist, uh, Marubini, and her boyfriend, Pierre, drive back home after Pierre's shift uh, at his restaurant. Uh, feeling, I quote, fire in her legs, I quote again, sharp pains in her stomach, uh, pains that represent um, another episode of the physical discomfort Marubini has been suffering from for a while, uh, to which we shall return later, while well, Marubini decides to run a bath and describes what she is feeling once in the water. That's slide number two, yeah. She says, uh, the black hand is still at my neck, squeezing. This situation um, is recurrent in the novel and the reader is therefore yearning to know what leads to such worrying episodes. Towards the end of the novel, Marubini's grandmothers uh, comment upon their granddaughter's uh, physical and uh, psychological state. Gogo uh, says, that's the second quote here, how can I diagnose something I have not observed? Who's to say whether it's trauma or the calling? There is therefore an uncertainty around the reasons that have led to Marubini's physical and psychological troubles. I have decided to focus on the first possible reason brought to the fore by Gogo, i.e. that of trauma. As readers, we soon realize that these episodes are intrinsically linked to the enigmatic statement at the beginning of the novel. I don't think my name is the problem. The real problem is all the lies. Marubini's neck being squeezed represents an act that clearly prevents Marubini, prevents her, from uttering words, from making her voice heard. After reading about this hand squeezing someone's throat, something that is repeated several times in the novel, I could not help but think of various Nigerian female buildings roman written recently. Marubini's physical incapacity to express what she's suffering from echoes that of Morenike, and Morayo in Yejide Kilanko's Daughters Who Walk This Path. It's a Nigerian novel uh, which I decided to study alongside the yearning in this paper. Language and the development or lack thereof of a voice are central to the female character's Bildung in Daughters Who Walk This Path. Whether it be Morayo, Morenike or Marubini, these characters are the victims 
of traumatic experiences of gender-based sexual violence, sexual abuse. They share the similar shattering and traumatic experience of rape. Daughters who walk this path takes place in modern day patriarchal Nigerian society from 1982 to 2005. It deals with the coming of age stories of cousins Morayo and Morenike in Abadan. The novel can be considered as a double Bildungsroman, both written in the first person, and this narrative strategy is also used by Mashiko, and in the third person. The experience of sexual abuse is also one lived by the character called Una in Becoming Unbecoming, a graphic uh, novel or a graphic memoir written by British artist Una. So that's slide number four. Um, the cover of the book uh, seems, uh, I, I'm uh, showing it to you here, uh, the cover of the book seems to indicate that the question of language is central. Now, see the empty bubble here. This coming-of-age story is set in 1977 in Yorkshire. At the time, uh, Peter Sutcliffe, also known as the Yorkshire Ripper, was at large. He is notorious for attempting to murder 20 women. He managed to kill 13 of them. This clearly appears as a central element in Una's formative years, as a teenager herself living in Yorkshire at the time. In her note at the end of the book, uh, Una explains... I have tried to build on some of Joan Smith's arguments in her book, Misogynies, around the victim-blaming culture of the Ripper inquiry, drawing on research in related texts and archived newspapers and on my own experience of the period in question. Una tells or draws about her victimization uh, as a young girl at that time. In 1977, she was only 12. I have decided to study these three works together as they provide a transnational corpus that will enable me to analyze gender-based violence, sexual trauma, and their literary representations. I would like to demonstrate how trauma works both as a pretext, as a theme, and as a device that informs the fabric of the texts. These three works seem to develop a poetics of trauma. I'm also interested in the coping mechanisms put in place by the protagonists. And as this seminar mainly focuses on Mohale Mashiro, I'll try to lay the emphasis on her novel more particularly. My paper will be divided into uh, three parts. Uh, first, uh, traumatic narratives of Bildung, daughters who walk this path. Second, yearning to find and voice the truth. And third, finding solace and healing in the community of women, becoming after and becoming. Last week in his paper, Richard Samin explained that the yearning belongs to various genres. Among other things, it's a narrative of Bildung, I quote, retracing the different episodes of Marubini's education into adulthood. As far as Yejide Kilanko's novel is concerned, and this is a part of the title of my paper, the protagonist's grandmother says to her, I quote, remember that others have walked this path before you, indicating a process of construction, a path to follow in order to become a woman in Nigerian patriarchal society. And we will see that this path, or rite of passage, so to speak, is an extremely problematic one. The title of Una's book also seems to point uh, to the importance of the construction of subjectivity. Becoming and becoming might be seen as echoing Bakhtin's essay on the Bildungsroman. Uh, this is the first quote uh, uh, here on the slide. Um, uh, so Bakhtin, where he mentions that uh, this literary genre uh, focuses on individuals, I quote, in the process of becoming. In her book on the Asian-American rewritings of the Bildungsroman genre, Alicia Otano explains that in the Bildungsroman, I quote, the use of the child's perspective as a narrative strategy plays a crucial role. The experiences lived and narrated will constitute their identity. The three writers under study here uh, all focus on the experiences of young girls in their respective patriarchal societies. This is done through uh, analepsis in the yearning, for instance. 
It is not clear what experiences Otano might be referring to, but you could echo uh, Jerome Buckley's famous study uh, of the Bildungsroman, where the critic uh, mentions sexual experiences as an important aspect in the growth of the protagonist of the traditional Bildungsroman. However, in these uh, three novels, sexual experience is replaced by sexual violence and trauma as defined uh, 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 thus on the slide seven. Yes, as defined thus. Sexual violence includes all forms of sexual assault, rape, attempted, attempted rape, contact and non-contact sexual violence and childhood sexual assault. It refers to unwanted and non-consenting sexual activity in childhood, adolescence and adulthood. Sexual trauma encompasses both the event and its impact on the individual. Sexual violence, including rape, problematically becomes part of the building's process of these protagonists. As Taylor explains, sexual trauma encompasses both the event and its impact on the individual. Therefore, I'd like to delve deeper into the narrative and aesthetic processes used by the three writers in order to expose the various impacts of sexual trauma within the confines of the Bildungsroman genre, uh, its traditional form being characterized, among other things, by linearity and teleology. Identity construction is at the very heart of these three novels. The three uh, of them depict the process of becoming of young girls uh, in patriarchal societies that can be deemed dangerous and detrimental to them because of their gender. Identity construction is central in Mashiro's book as exemplified in the following excerpt, which takes place after one of Pierre's shifts at his restaurant. Slide eight. When I lower myself into the water, so that's Marubini speaking here. Huh? When I lower myself into the water, the pain seems to subside somewhat. My jaw locks again, but uh, the rest of my body relaxes. I am vibrating, pulsating. I have become my heart. Blood rushes through me, healing the fire inside of me, and my whole body is pounding. The lights above me are moving as one with the water I'm submerged in. A black streak appears in front of me. Something dark and rancid is spilling into my bath water. The black streak becomes a hand that wraps itself around my neck and holds me down in the water. Panic. The black hand is still at my neck, squeezing. Identity or subjectivity is at the heart of the core of this passage as no fewer than 17 occurrences of I, my, me or myself appear. Marubini's body is also an extremely important vehicle for Bildung here, as the verbs vibrating, pulsating, and pounding all seem to indicate a, a situation of intense stress and discomfort. This passage echoes the pain felt by Marubini during the rape she goes through as a child at the hands of the school's gatekeeper. So uh, she says at, at that point, I fear him more than I do the pain that is burning into me. This is only one example among many that puts to the fore the prevalence of episodes of repetitions in the novel, repetition being a possible trace of trauma. According to Katie Carruth in Unclaimed Experience, Trauma Narrative History, I quote, traumatic events violate the autonomy of the person at the level of basic in bodily integrity. The body is invaded, injured, defiled. It is literally the case regarding the protagonists of these three uh, novels as they undergo sexual violence, including rape, lived as a violation and a wound, both physical and psychological. For lack of time, I have decided to concentrate on one representation of rape and its uh, impact on the narrative. The episode of sexual violence assault uh, uh, is alluded to in a few details by Una on slide uh, 10. Um, I don't know if you uh, see very well, but she concentrates uh, more uh, so on, on the left uh, uh, picture. Uh, she concentrates more on the impacts of this traumatic event. 
uh, you can see uh, on the drawing on the right that she uh, sort of describes a burden she's living with uh, because uh, of the rape she's been through. And she declares in the bubble uh, on the right, I soon learned to lower my gaze, pointing here uh, to shame, the shame she might feel after uh, being uh, abused. Yet what seems clear is that uh, Una relies a great deal on the power, maybe not the power of words, but the power of images, on what the drawing suggests, as words seem to fail to describe what she's been through. The traumatic event is referred to, but not in explicit terms. In the yearning, rape is alluded to in a more direct manner, but also revealed through the woman who later saves Marubini uh, from the hands of her aggressor. At that moment, Marubini, the child, is locked inside uh, the gatekeeper's home. Uh, she says, Marubini says, I think she, the woman who saves her later, uh, saves her from the hands of, of this man, uh, can see me. But then she turns her attention to the other side of the room where the bloody bed is. She gasps and then I don't see her again. This passage uh, is an analepsis written in the present tense in order for it to be more impactful. It is nevertheless very different in Daughters Who Walk This Path, where the scenes of the rapes of Morayo and Morenike are very explicit. The following excerpt describes Morayo's confusion uh, while being raped by her cousin, Bros T. Inside my head, a shrill voice screamed, what little boyfriend? Bros T forced his tongue into my mouth and I gagged. Desperate to free myself, I struggled under his weight. He whispered softly into my ear, stop this nonsense or I will call Jimmy and Niran to come. I am sure they will be very happy to join us. Is that what you want? I shook my head widely, side to side. Please. I stilled my thrashing limbs. I heard the metal rings of the bed creak as Busty stretched out his long, heavy body on top of mine. Through the use of italics, the interior monologue uh, transcribes Morayo's lack of understanding, of understanding of what is going on. Her plea, please, is particularly striking because it is very brief. It is also not heard because it's not articulated. Prosti ignores the fear of his victim and physically and psychologically affirms his authority over her. This is clearly an attack against the unified self of Morayo, this menace uh, regarding unicity is visible in the texts themselves through the use of italics, as we've just seen, but also in the yearning through the use of different fonts when the text refers to the embedded narrative. Moreover, in the yearning, a shapeless, menacing figure that haunts Marubini with a hand that keeps attemp attempting to stifle her symbolizes a constant threat for these women. Moreover, among the various techniques that attest to the impact of the traumatic rape are the fragmentation of narratives, multiple viewpoints, an experimental approach to the representation of time, repetitions, interruptions of the linear narrative, elements identified by Laura Vicroy in Trauma and Survival in Contemporary Fiction, where she writes, this is the next slide, uh, stylistic innovations have reflected our understanding of consciousness as well as our capacity to imagine the human psyche in all its facets and have proved effective in approximating for readers the psychic defenses that pose obstacles to narrating and recovering from trauma. In addition, according to Sonia Andemar and Sylvia Pellicer Ortin in Trauma Narratives and Her Story, in the trauma literature de dealing with female victims, there exists um, a trope of split personality. In this context, the finding of a voice is central in order to try and develop coping mechanisms after having been uh, a victim of sexual trauma. So. Early in Mashiro's uh, novel, the reader realizes that Marubini is obsessed with the eponymous yearning. I quote, 
My brother only knows a father when he looks in the mirror. The yearning haunts him. My mother turns away from the traditions of the past. The yearning confuses her. I speak as only half of myself. The yearning hurts me. The yearning never stops till we embrace everything that brought us here. In our quiet denial, the yearning devours us. First, the repetition of the word yearning seems to point to what Anne Whitehead explains in trauma fiction. I quote, one of the key literary strategies in trauma fiction is the device of repetition, which can act at the levels of language, imagery or plot. Repetition mimics the effects of trauma, for it suggests the insistent return of the event and the disruption of narrative chronology or progression. There is a yearning for the truth, as terrible as it is, and in Marubini's case, understanding part of her past, which she seems to have forgotten, but which her body remembers. She talks, after all, about the voice of her body. She had, in a way, forgotten uh, the traumatic experience of rape as her father decided to heal her by taking blood from her. After this, as a sangoma, a healer, he was supposed to become the bearer of his daughter's burden. One of the most potent images of repetition or return is that of Morayo, Morenike and Marubini's nightmares, which echo uh, Kat Katie Carruth's claim. Uh, the return of the traumatic experience in the dream is not the signal of the direct experience, but rather of the attempt to overcome the fact that it was not direct to attempt to master what was never fully grasped in the first place. It is particularly the case in the yearning. These nightmares are linked to a search for truth. For Marita Nadal and Monica Calbo in Trauma in Contemporary Literature, Narrative and Representation, silence is a symptom of trauma. Uh, I quote, trauma constitutes the realm of the unspeakable and the unrepresentable. These girls uh, have been raped, uh, become the embodiment of philomela in Greek mythology. In Metamorphoses, that's the next uh, slide, and I'm, um, I was particularly interested in this cover of uh, Ovid's uh, Metamorphoses, and I was really thinking of um, Cathy Bira last week, who talked about the uh, drawings that we can find in intruders that I uh, uh, could actually see uh, some sort of parallel between the cover of Ovid's Metamorphoses and, and intruders, but that's just in passing. Um, so in Metamorphoses, Ovid uh, explains that Philomela has her tongue cut out for wanting to tell the terrible truth of the rape uh, she's been through. Even though, even though she is therefore unable to voice what she underwent, Philomela weaves the crime into a tapestry which her sister has access to. Una's novel might be the closest to Philomela's tapestry. And at the end of the book, Una writes, I quote, I like to think of this as my tapestry. Like Philomela, who wove her own story after her tongue was cut out, this is my communication, my contribution, as one among many. In Kilanko's novel, it is only when Morayo finds the strength to explain what happened to her, when she finds the strength to make her voice heard, that she finds her salvation. I quote, then my voice rang out clearly in the silence. Brosty, Brosty had been coming to my room at night. Saying this seems to be a cathartic act. She later explicitly says she's been raped. Speaking out constitutes a first step towards healing. In Perceiving Pain in African Literature, Zoe Norwich explains, I quote, something of a consensus has already developed that takes trauma as the unrepresentable to assert that trauma is beyond language in some crucial way, that language fails in the face of trauma, and that trauma mocks language and confronts it with its insufficiency. Yet, at the same time, language about trauma is theorized uh, no, sorry about that. Yet, at the same time language about trauma is theorized as an impossibility, language is pressed forward as that which can heal 
the survivor of trauma. So the passage from silence to speech can constitute a technique allowing to articulate the destroying effect uh, of trauma upon uh, the individual and uh, her narrative. On slide 16. Uh, yes. In debunking patriarchy, the liberational quality of voicing in Tsitsi Dangaremga's nervous conditions, Pauline Uwakwe explains, I quote, voicing is self-defining, liberational and cathartic. It proclaims an, an individual as a conscious being capable of independent thought and action. So by speaking up, Morayo in uh, Daughters Who Walk This Path uh, displays agency. The time it took her to speak up is also linked to the way uh, girls are raised in patriarchal societies, as Bell Hooks uh, explains in The Will to Change. She explains, I was taught as a girl in a patriarchal household that rage was not an appropriate feminine feeling, that it should not only not be expressed, but be eradicated. Keeping males and females from telling the truth about what happens to them in families is one way, patri is one way patriarchal culture is maintained. OK, next slide. Thank you. These three novels, therefore, show the importance of finding the truth about one's past and speaking up. However, yet another element seems to be central in order to find solace for these women to start a healing process. The community of intra-textual women have a huge role in this. In her novel, which addresses sexual violence in a transnational way, Una makes the portrait of three real-life Congolese women, as you can see um, on uh, this picture. Um, well, these women allow uh, um, uh, to stress, uh, uh, no, sorry, sorry about that. So they, they allow to stress the importance for uh, female activists to be given a voice, especially because they act for a community of women to liberate themselves from the shackles of patriarchy. In Kilanko and Mashiho's novels, the community of women is central in order to grow up and heal. In The Yearning, it is therefore not surprising to notice that the end of the book has much to do with womanhood and traditional rites of passage for women. Once again, in that precise excerpt, the font used is that which allows the reader to know that this is a memory of the past, which enables us also to attend Marubini's passage into womanhood. As the elder Marubini's grandmother, Enhono, is in charge of the ceremony uh, whose importance she defines. So next slide, yeah. People don't see the use for something that makes women stronger. They would encourage it if we were making sure that these girls didn't know how to be powerful and belong to themselves. And Hono explains to the girls and women present at the ceremony, I quote, most of you are here because you have started flowing like the ocean does with the moon. Others are here because, well, soon you will be considered too old. She laughed a little as she said this. You have been told by misinformed people that this is where you will learn to be good wives and how to pleasure your husbands. Some of the older girls giggled. They are wrong and you will be disappointed to find that men are hardly ever mentioned here. It was the turn of the old women to laugh. We let people believe this error because otherwise we will not be allowed to teach you what we do. So now you can never tell anyone what you learn here, ever. The people who will know are people who have been uh, through this too. You are now part of an elite group of women who have been through this rite of passage and belong to themselves. The bonds between women during this initiation ceremony are perceived as extremely important for the development of strong-willed, powerful women who do have a voice. The idea of being, a quote, connected to their source and how they were connected to the forces of nature is also worth taking a look at, as nature seems to be a source of strength and recovery for these women. Moreover, according to Doris Laub and Shoshana Fellman, an interlocutor 
uh, is necessary in order for trauma to be recognized as such. A quote, the absence of an empathetic listener, or more radically, the absence of an addressable other, an other who can hear the anguish of one's memories and thus affirm and recognize their realness, annihilates the story. At the end of the yearning and daughters who walk this path, this female interlocutor is indeed present. Moreover, healing, central in the three texts under scrutiny, but maybe even more so in the yearning, as Marubini's father becomes a sangoma, a traditional healer, and so does Marubini herself, uh, can be found in yet another community. This community can also find solace and healing in the texts under study. This community is that of extra textual women who might have been uh, the victims of sexual violence and trauma at some points, some point in their lives. Here, I would like to go back to, sorry, I'm going to have to go back to some male figures, uh, to what Paul Ricoeur uh, explains uh, in uh, Temps et Récits and in La Métaphore Vive, where he perceives a literary work as a form of communication. And maybe the most striking example of this is Una's Becoming and Becoming, when she explains, I quote, when I began drawing, I didn't plan to show the work to anyone, so it is odd to be sharing it with the world now. Many of the earlier, earliest drawings will forever remain private, but some of the early, quite abstract drawings are included here. They can be understood as functioning on a more unconscious, symbolic level uh, than the more conventional narrative panels. I think they communicate something that words perhaps cannot. Communication and community share the same root, Latin communicare, sharing, entering in relation with. This community is made of implied readers, i.e. maybe female readers, as defined by Wayne C. Booth in The Rhetoric of Fiction. There is therefore an interaction between the author, the text and the implied female readers that appeals uh, to extra textual readers. It is all the more important that these novels also have a mimetic quality as conceptualized by Roland Barthes, since they refer to real life events, real life uh, periods, the uh, apartheid, the Yorkshire Ripper, or 1990s uh, dictatorship in Nigeria. I'd like to conclude with the idea of community once again. At the end of Daughters uh, uh, Who Walk This Path, Morayo makes a series of promises to her baby daughter. I quote, I promise that for you, there will be fewer secrets. I promise to talk about whatever causes you pain, to talk about shame. I promise to listen even when I do not understand. I promise because you are worth it. We're promising to talk, to listen to young girls when they might have something to say about traumatic experiences is central at the end of Kilanko's novel which also acts as a didactic uh, novel. I can also see didactism in Una's um, uh, drawings, uh, particularly this one, where uh, she describes, uh, I don't know if you can read that, but an ocean of sexual crimes uh, unreported with just uh, numbers that uh, serve as water. So the yearning also ends with the birth of the protagonist's daughter, very positive note in this novel, pointing, of course, to the future. Communication, therefore, seems to be central and I'd like to end maybe with uh, what Mashiro explains uh, about the importance and relevance of stories that must be written. So I'm just going, going to read here, and that's part of the yearning and uh, more particularly in uh, the very short text before the yearning, um, entitled From Sweet Valley High to the Yearning. And she writes, stories matter and so do the voices of storytellers. Your story matters and so does your voice. Who can blame some people for thinking that they do not belong in the literary world? I often feel that way, I often feel that way, and I am now part of this world. How do we remedy this? We keep writing, show up for each other, read uh, outside our comfort zones, give different voices a platform, buy self-published books, read each other's stories and never forget. All stories matter because we do belong. Your story matters. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Cédric, <clears throat> for your presentation. The PowerPoint was, as promised, gorgeous. <laughs> um, we're, well, we're waiting uh, for questions to arrive. Um, I'll ask my own question. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more about the graphic novel and the transfer of trauma into images, the visualization of transfer, what, what specificity the graphic novel has compared to the other works that you've been working on? Yeah, um, that's a, a very uh, interesting question. I basically decided that was a late uh, change in my uh, presentation. I really wanted to uh, to discover Una's work, first of all, quite, well, I would say uh, four or five weeks ago. And uh, I um, was really thinking about the impact of trauma upon language and how it disarticulates language, how it can destroy language, how it can stop you from voicing. Uh, uh, that's particularly the case in uh, uh, Yeji de Kilanko's work. But also I was particularly obsessed with this uh, as many Nigerian uh, novels written since 2000, uh, particularly female Bildungsroman, are uh, uh, obsessed with the, this question of voice. I'm thinking of uh, Purple Hibiscus by uh, Chimamanda and Gozi Adichie, for example, so a very famous writer that many people know. That's her first novel. Uh, she, she doesn't suffer from uh, sexual trauma, but she's still traumatized by her father and the way he raises her. But uh, there's this uh, special concern on uh, my part uh, of, of thinking of trauma and how it can yeah, have an impact on voice. And uh, reading Una, I thought it was very complementary with the other works in the sense that Una does emphasize the, the impossibility to voice uh, this particular sexual trauma and she found a way uh, to f voice it is to basically just even draw very simplistic uh, drawings but to which um, maybe more people can relate maybe I don't know uh, but uh, yeah that's why I, I decided to, to really focus on that and see how complementary they could work uh, how complementary these three works uh, are. Um, so we've got um, first a remark uh, from Sami Ludwig, who's very happy to see Alicia Otano's book there because mm. uh, he was an editor of that series. Um, okay. <laughs> we also have a question from one of our master students, Ludovic Dias, who says, listening about the three novels, I think about Alice Walker's writings. Would you consider them as an inspiration for young African female writers? And there's another another remark. He says the fact that Walker comes from African from an African American background is maybe just a coincidence. Girls coming out coming of age narrative in violent patriarchal societies is universal, aren't they? Mm -hmm. So there you are. Maybe uh, considering whether you consider that Alice Walker's writings work as an inspiration for young African uh, female writers? Mm -hmm. I do think so. Um, well, I think, first of all, if, um, well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not a specialist of uh, Mohale Mashiro's work. Uh, however, um, I heard that she, uh, in some interviews, that she uh, quotes Alice Walker. Uh, and she uh, says that, yes, indeed, uh, that, that's part of her uh, inspiration writing, maybe not the yearning, but part of her inspiration as, as an artist. And uh, uh, so, yeah, I think uh, it's Ludovic, right? Uh, Ludovic, yes, you're, you're right. Uh, and I would uh, uh, tend to agree with you in the sense that uh, uh, there's some sort of universality of coming of age uh, uh, stories uh, for girls uh, um, growing up in, in patriarchal societies. This is the reason why there's this transnational corpus that I decided to, 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 to use today. And uh, I didn't specifically insist on uh, South African patriarchy because I would be uh, very unable to talk about it because I don't know much about it. Uh, I didn't specifically talk about Nigerian patriarchy or, or, or whatever, uh, uh, because that those are universal, indeed, universal stories. And there's this also this universality also of the drawings by Una. Uh, this is also part of her um, 
the, 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 this is one of the reasons why also she is so inspirational. I believe that uh, any any um, um, let's say culture could actually identify to those uh, drawings as well. You don't need much. You don't need all those words, and that, actually there are not many words in Una's work. Uh, everything is transmitted through images and the visual. Uh, yeah. All right, uh, we have two more questions. So the first one is from Indiana Lodz, who says, I was wondering if you would like to elaborate on rape and South Africa and South all South African literature. I've been reading quite different South African novels, each dealing with rape at some point, the yearning, disgrace, a dry white season, period pains, etc. Yeah, um, well, once again, um, yeah, I have period pain here. That's uh, I have just started it, but I think, uh, well, once again, I'm really not a specialist of South African literature, so I, I really do not want to 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 pretend. Uh, but um, I, I think I, I could have uh, some sort of an answer. Uh, uh, well, it's uh, there's no denying and no. Uh, it's it, it, it's not a secret for anyone that uh, rape, uh, well, South Africa suffers from a, a rape uh, epidemic, uh, uh, something that is uh, uh, really um, corrupting uh, the, the social fabric. And um, uh, so I would say this is probably, uh, again, I'm um, assuming that this is one of the reasons why uh, 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 p uh, rape might be so present uh, and omnipresent. Uh, in South African um, uh, literature, um, and I would be tempted to uh, to believe, and maybe again, um, maybe I'm wrong because South Africa is really not um, my domain of expertise. But uh, um, because women um, manage to have a voice more and more, and women dare. To write, huh? uh, to, to go back to Mohali Mashihorn, uh, who says your story matters, so uh, do not hesitate, basically, to write and tell uh, your story. Um, well, th these elements, uh, uh, this element of, of sexual assault, rape, and so on, uh, will probably uh, 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 come up a lot uh, in literature. Um, but this is again me assuming that and. Uh, maybe there are uh, South African um, experts here that uh, uh, would prove me wrong, but uh, this is my take on that. Um, sorry, oops, I lost my window, sorry. Um, sorry, I um, it's okay. rarely left the room. <laughs> Meanwhile, I can actually have a drink. Yes, so for, for just just a, a, this was done on purpose for Cedric to take a drink of water. Uh, we've yeah. got lots of questions, so um, and time is running out. I guess we'll just take two final ones in the order in which they arrived, so as not to discriminate on any unfair grounds. Uh, we've got a question from Kathy Bira, who presented last week, who's who says that you I, talked I, about I the role of women. Uh, in Maru's healing in the yearning, what about the men, particularly her father? I mean, generally speaking, what is the role of men and the nature of the relations between men and women? Well, thank you very much, Katie. And um, this is um, the reason why I, when I edited my um, uh, paper, I eliminated a lot of uh, patriarchal or references to patriarchy because obviously I should have been maybe a bit more um, maybe honest in my approach because there are very important men like Maru's father who uh, I think I said it in the paper but uh, who uh, contributes um, to uh, her healing by uh, basically taking a bit of blood from her after the, 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 the rape uh, to basically make her forget and become the burden of uh, uh, the not the burden becomes the bearer of her burden. So obviously, uh, men. Uh, well, this is what Mohale Mashiro tries to to convey. I suppose that men do have uh, uh, an important uh, role in 
education of, of the education of women. But I think the, the emphasis is really uh, when you pay attention to the end of the book that I uh, focused on um, towards the end of my presentation, um, the emphasis really is on uh, relationship, well, uh, community, a community of women. And it doesn't mean that men are necessarily hostile or, or uh, particularly violent to women, not all of them. Uh, you have Pierre, the boyfriend who's uh, uh, a lovely man, I suppose, uh, look, uh, sounds like a lovely man. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, not all men are terrible creatures in, in that uh, novel. Um, and then the final question we'll take for today uh, is a question from Vanessa Guignori, who's asking, what do you make of the fact that the author of Becoming Unbecoming uses the single name Una thus silencing at least part of her identity to write a graphic novel which is partly autobiographical. Yes, thank you. Um, that's very interesting and I think this is also something we uh, kind of talked about uh, before uh, with uh, Marilyn and uh, Monica and, and, and Celine about Una who, um, well, as I said before, I, I didn't know her. Um, well, I've, I've known her work for, for for like five or six weeks now, uh, but it's interesting uh, to see that she's um, uh, not necessarily extremely uh, uh, present on um, the internet. She is not extremely visible. So, uh, contrary to many many uh, other writers, for example. Um, and th there is indeed this idea of secrecy and um, well, being political, but um, uh, the, the personal, of course, is political. But here, there is maybe something that is uh, um, still. Again, I'm not a psychologist, uh, that, so that's complicated to talk like this. But um, something that is still uh, uh, so painful that uh, there's a need to 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 remain uh, in the margins, in the shadows. Uh, she talks a lot uh, in this autobiographical memoir, in this memoir, about uh, shadows being in the shadows, trying to uh, hide yourself, lower your gaze. So, it, yeah, I'm not sure what I can, I'm not on, uh, I'm not sure I'm answering the question, but yeah, this is, <laughs> actually I have to think a little bit more about it. Yeah, yeah, well, thank you very much for, for this question. <laughs> Well, thank you um, very much all for your questions. We'll be uh, saving them so Cédric can have a look at them. Of course, you can get in touch with him. He works at the University of Lille. So you can look up his email address if you really, really want your question answered. Uh, but thank you very much for watching. Um, thank you for your questions. And I think I'd like to take the time to thank again both our speakers for a very uh, interesting session on trauma and different forms. Uh, from photography all the way to novels and uh, the graphic novels. So many thanks again to Lorena Rizzo and Cédric Courtois. Uh, and we'll see you next week uh, for the fourth seminar.